Early in my youth ministry career, we were doing a youth trip about three hours away, and the administrator had called to make the reservation for the 15-passenger van. And this was back when you had to call people to do things like that, not just enter something on a website. And I go to pick the vehicle up, and there's a whole lot of confusion because the woman at the desk can't find the information about this van. And we're going around in circles, and I'm like, Christ Episcopal Church. And she looks at me finally and says, I can't even spell or say Episcopal. What does it mean? I did a brief explanation. Eventually, we figured out that the way it had gotten entered into the system at the rental place was Christ Apostolic, all one word, church. We did eventually find it. We did eventually get, I'm not kidding, the van was Barney Purple. And of course, the youth named it Barney. We got our van. Everything was fine. But that moment of the woman at the desk just looking at me going, I don't even know how to say or spell that. And that place where it's a word that conveys an important meaning for who we think we are. But on the other hand, it creates a little bit of a stumbling block because it doesn't always immediately convey what we intend it to convey. So today, my guest is one of my favorite people. And I have to confess, one of my only my only lay guests in this season, and I'm embarrassed about that as a person who had a 20-year lay career, but I will make up for that in a future season. So I am the Reverend Jane Gober. I am the rector of Christ Church in Ridley Park, Pennsylvania, and this is Right Questions. And today we are talking about church structure, which is part of what the word Episcopal is trying to explain. And I have invited my friend, Andrea, and Andrea serves at every level of the church. Tell us a little bit about yourself and all the different ways in which you're involved in the structure and decision-making of the Episcopal Church. Thanks, Jane. So um, I like to say I'm a professional Episco dork, so I live that out um, my professional career currently as canon for finance and administration in the Diocese of South Carolina, and I live in Charleston, South Carolina. I also serve as a general convention deputy and on a few committees. I've enjoyed doing um, interim body work that I'll talk a little bit about later. And then um, I currently serve on executive council, um, which is like the vestry for the Episcopal Church in between general conventions. Um, so enjoy serving many different levels. And I've done lots of things in my own church as a Christian formation director, um, Sunday school teacher. Um, video, uh, during COVID, I was our video editor for all of our Sunday services. So I'm involved in lots of many, many different ways. And part of how we were acquainted, actually the way we were acquainted, was through Forma, which I don't remember if we met back when it was still called NACID, but Forma is a network of Christian formation people, but also does some advocacy work on the level of the churchwide bodies. So that's part of where we got acquainted, and now we go to baseball games and do things like that together when we're in the same town. Yeah, I found Forma in 2012, so it was right after NASED. Okay, and um, so I've been been a member since for 10 years now. So, and we're grateful for it. So today's episode is tied to the book by our mutual friend, Your Faith, Your Life, and it's tied to Chapter Five, which is going to go into a lot more detail about this. But if you are just listening, I hope you get a little bit of a broad scope of the structures and decision-making about how we choose how we live together as a church. So the question I ask everybody is, what are the four to five most important things that someone might want to know about the structure, about the decision-making and direction-taking systems that make up the Episcopal Church? Well, I am a structure person and the, we kind of are split into four structures. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about each one of those and how it ties in. So first we have our church level, which is all of us that are, attend our local parish or mission. Um, and that is the really important work 
that that happens in our church, the day to day things that we are doing to be Christ in the world and serve our communities. But we are not a congregational denomination. So we have some structure that goes up from there. So the second thing is our diocese. And this is where many people think of it. Um, they know their bishop and the bishop has a staff. Um, so but the diocese is not the diocesan staff. It is still the people that go in it and the staff does work towards that. So in your different dioceses, do, do it different ways. Some people have a standing committee and a diocesan council. That's how uh, we do it in the diocese of South Carolina. I know some people that have combined them into an executive committee type thing where they do that work, but there are people that are elected to do the work. And so this is the lay people and priests that are active in their communities. Then we go one step up from that, and that's the denominational level. So this is the Episcopal Church, Um, and this everybody loves our, you know, the royal wedding preacher, uh, presiding Bishop Curry, and so he is the head of that level. But it is not just just as in our democracy in the United States, the the system is not just the presiding bishop. We have the president of the House of Deputies. We have a general convention that meets every three years and does the work of the church and does really good work to decide what are our mission matters? What is our budget going to go to? That it's not just 10 days off in a random location doing work that doesn't really matter. I mean, it really affects those layers of what's happening in the diocese and in the church. And then, so executive council that I serve on is that group that meets in between general conventions to keep making sure that work happens. Um, And then we have the Anglican Communion, which is the layer above that. So the Episcopal Church is one of the provinces around the world. And we are the only province um, in the United States. And that's important in many ways um, with some other groups that talk about being Anglican, but are not tied in that same way to the Anglican Communion. It was really, um, this summer was the Lambeth Conference. That is something that happens usually every 10 years, although um, lately it has been less often for different reasons. Things have been put off um, when there's difficult conversations that need to happen or this time because of COVID. Um, And that's a time when all the bishops from all the provinces around the world get together. So we can see that we are, um, we are a tiny little dot in, in a big world that's serving Christ. And then even around that is Christians around the world. That, that identify as other denominations that we are working together among that. So our structure, well, you know, the day to day, you're just going to see your church. Um, there's a lot more going on that helps support that church level work as well. There is a great deal more that goes on. You know, one of the things is we tend to get a little, I don't want to say caught up, but I'm going to go with that word, caught up in the idea that the only way in which decisions are made or connectivity happens is through the Episcopal structures, by which I mean the bishop structures. And that's what the word Episcopal means. Basically, it means churches with a church with bishops. And there are ways in which that level of decision making and allegiance have changed over time. The official duties are very much the same, but even just like how much individuals know on a congregational level and so on has changed with modern communications. So one of the things that happened this summer at General Convention, which you were at General Convention with the Diocese of South Carolina. So one of the things that happened this summer was a shift in a diocese. So like the list of dioceses and the map that are in the book and that I don't know how much the churchwide website has updated everything yet. I would hope they rushed to do it since this has been being worked on for a while. Well, it actually, while we voted on it, I believe it doesn't officially take effect until January 1. So it is okay while they are already acting in that way. It's okay if it's not updated yet. All right. So um, we are talking about something that maybe not all of our listeners know what in the world we're talking about. So would you explain a little bit of that journey? Sure. So I'm actually going to back up to 2015. So in 2015, we welcomed the Diocese of Cuba back in, um, and that added, uh, created 110 dioceses in the um, in the Episcopal Church, and that was uh, due to lots of political things that had happened. And um, it, I believe, it was about 50 years that they were out of the Episcopal Church, and so that was very joyful. I believe it was. Yeah. So being able to bring them back. So then the Diocese of Northwest Texas, which was formerly known as the Diocese of Fort Worth, had been through a similar journey as South Carolina, that there had been a schism, um, that there had been a 
the what the bishop and the majority of the leadership in the diocese did not agree with the direction the Episcopal Church was going. And they chose to take their diocese out of the Episcopal Church, which is not actually something you can do. So um, they did end up creating their own group separately. Um, but lots of faithful Episcopalians stayed. And in Fort Worth, um, since it's most of it is the city of Fort Worth, I'm referring to that, but the diocese did have had to change names. Um, there were a lot of faithful groups meeting in really creative spaces. They were in, um, there was in a, a local theater group. They met in the, in their theater, um, each week. There was a group meeting at a wedding chapel. Um, then after there for a while, I think there was someone in like a bank lobby, um, and just really creative work that was going on to continue the mission of the Episcopal Church in that area. So as the unfortunate lawsuits kept going and changing, and um, they realized that they they were losing property, the Diocese of Texas, which they used to be a part of when Texas was um, one huge diocese for the whole state. Um, offered some communications that they started conversations and decided to bring the, that diocese back into the Diocese of Texas, which because we are not congregational and we are not just a diocesan level, you can't just be like, okay, come on over. We're, you're going to be our pal now. Um, it did take a vote of convention. And so each of the dioceses voted that they wanted to do it. So we knew that everyone was on board. And then the general convention got to vote to approve it, which was just such a joyful time. Um, were you watching when that happened? I, don't I was. Oh, it was so exciting to see, especially I've known so many of those people since we're in a similar spot, um, that they've just been so faithful for so many years and to see some, some joy and know that there will be longevity um, that the Diocese of Texas has the resources to really keep them going, which is really great. Thank you for that explanation of how something, a change happened and happened in an official way and not just in a casual way that it took many years of conversation and prayer and working together, but also passing legislation through our church bodies to help us make the best choices for everyone. You mentioned our, you've mentioned twice our not being congregational, which is something that we are constantly having to name because some of it's embedded in American culture, just rugged individualism, and I can do whatever I want with my group of people. But the analogy I like to use is the Episcopal Church is a little like a large franchise <laughs> with different franchisees that, you yeah. know... I'm going to use an example that isn't everybody's favorite example, but I'm going to use it anyways. So all Starbucks are Starbucks and they work through the corporation and have standards and ways they need to do things. Now, they can do some experimentation at a local level. Like the Frappuccino was invented by a manager at a Starbucks in like Southern California, if I remember, and they were selling really well. And she tried to convince, you know, her like, regional managers of this and they weren't getting into it so much but then like somebody from a higher level up happened to stop by a store one day and tried it and thought it was great and the rest is history but um so a we're all in this together if one of us runs out of beans we're supposed to lend beans to the next store over there's some expectation about what stores look and feel like but there are gonna, there's going to be differences, and those differences are beautiful and an expression of the Holy Spirit. All of that getting is getting back to part of how we decide what's um, normative is through an interplay of congregations needing to do what they need to do, choosing to make some choices, but then um, working through systems at all of these multiple levels yeah, before something becomes the official practice. Yeah. And that's, what's great about our book of common prayer. I mean, that's what I didn't, I honestly, as a kid never connected that common prayer meant we were all saying the same prayer. And, and, you know, there are different expressions of that now, which I love because I do, uh, but we are the same flow of worship is happening across all of our churches in many different languages, in many different expressions, um, but that we are still 
having those same standards of things. Um, but it's interesting. I love going visiting Episcopal churches when I travel, and it's so interesting to see different ones. That I grew up in a church that was built um, in 1650 in the in Virginia, um, and so it, all the churches that I grew up around were brick. They usually had a red door that, you know, it was glass windows and then um, moved to places that had stained glass. I just hadn't been around stained glass at all. And so it is, you know, while we have that and and now beautiful white clabbered churches, I just I have a love for itty bitty churches in small towns um, that have like eight strong members and yeah. um, and 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 are the ones that are like holding the social system for their entire town up, these eight people. But it's so great that I can walk into them and feel comfortable in that liturgy that I know um, I can be invited into that space and and welcome the differences that they have. There are a number of examples where small churches are doing really incredible work of the gospel in their neighborhoods. Yeah, we have one. Um, it's called St. Stephen's, St. Stephen's. And again, it's a historic church. Um, and they, they're they probably 18 to 20 on a Sunday. Um, and they are the... they serve the town Thanksgiving dinner. They have an after school tutoring program for youth. I mean, there's always something happening at this little church. And so I, when the Bishop, um, we have a new Bishop yesterday was her one year anniversary, Bishop Ruth with the Stanley. And when she was doing her first bi- visits to churches, when I knew she was going there, I told her they punch above their weight, <laughs> but I love those stories that we, we can't just be churches that, open her doors for an hour on Sunday morning. If we don't need a building for that. Um, and, and I love seeing what they're doing in the world. <clears throat> in our diocese, we have a grant program and one of our small churches um, just applied for a grant for a bookmobile that their local library serves three counties in a very, very underprivileged part of South Carolina. And um, their bookmobile had broken down years ago and they didn't have the money to repair it. And they just decided that this was going to be their project. And they, they raised almost all the money from local churches in that area and then came to the diocese to fund the remaining amount. And we were so happy to be a part of that. But I love the things that are going on, the creative ideas that people do. Mm-hmm. It, one part of the structures are systems for safety, for accountability, for um, not everybody doing whatever the heck they want. But some of the structures are about mutual support, that there is not a single congregation or congregant in the Episcopal Church who should feel like they're trying, they have to do everything all by themselves and all alone. There's always people, part of what our systems and how we finance the systems of diocesan and churchwide and even Anglican communion life um, contribute to there always being someone that you can reach out to. Now, the answer you may get is no. We love you. We support you. The answer could be no. That's crazy. But um, I feel like most of the time we want to be mutually supportive. And it may be that there's not um, the resource you're looking for or the connection, and maybe it needs to be created. But one of the things about the structures is no one's going it alone. And if a church feels it that feels that way, there's a chance maybe they're not engaging the structure. Yeah, I, I will say that there sometimes is a holy no. That <laughs> sometimes there's very good reasons for the no. And yeah, uh, you know, I love. I, I had a bishop I worked for that said both and for a lot of things when I would ask him questions. Um, that improv answers yes and no and yeah, <laughs> but it is no and. How can we work to it to turn this into a yes? And and I think that that is the wonderful thing about our structure is that there's people to do that. That so many people don't realize there are people on the Episcopal Church staff that let's say youth ministry, for example, you have a question about youth ministry and thinks there's people that would love to talk to you about that and have great ideas. And and they don't they aren't the experts. And don't want to be the experts, but they can connect so much as the network that they can connect you to the people, just like we got connected in Forma. Those networks have been so important for me in the Episcopal Church that connect those structures, um, but also just that mutual flourishing. Absolutely. And and it's also one of the things that when I um, spend time with colleagues who are in congregational congregations, whether it's other denominations or even 
sometimes actually some of our, our um, Jewish and Islamic brothers and sisters don't necessarily have the same level of structure anyways, that they're just amazed that there's someone that I can call to ask a question about X, Y, or Z um, instead of having to make it up all on my own if I don't have the expertise to do so. Yeah. Very few times are you the first one that's ever had that situation, right? So we can learn so much from each other. We can. The next question, every time. Did we finish your four points? I think we did. Yes, we did. We did. All right. So my next question every time is, so what can we do? What can we try? Anyone, someone who's listening to this broadcast, what could they take on maybe? I think what's wonderful about our structures is there's something for everyone. There are things in your local church. Spiritual gifts is a wonderful, I love when people do spiritual gift assessments and find out where they fit in in different things, because not everyone is going to be the hospitality chair. Like I have a, I have a former coworker who's spiritual gift is hospitality. And she was so shocked when she took the test to find that, but she's the one that hosts like every party and get together. Like she's always baking something for some new baby and thing. And it was so obvious to the rest of us that there are, you know, a a mutual friend of ours, Wendy, um, when I had a baby, she told me about that when her son was little, she called the people in her church, holy holders that they were the ones that would hold her son while she did a children's sermon or while she was running around getting all the Sunday school stuff ready. And I loved when my kids were little and I had those holy holders. I wish I could be one now. I love holding babies. But um, there, there's things. Um, my mother is very gifted in art. And so she's active in her church in those ways. But then to the next level, um, be active in your diocese. Find out what's happening. Go to diocesan convention. Um, put your name in for, for some of the different things. If you have a financial background, there's a room for you. If there's a legal background, if you're a historian, there's archivist things that happen. If you're someone that's good on keeping people on task, sign up for your convention planning team. Um, There's so many ways you can be involved. And then on the church level, what's been amazing is I don't know the full number, but we used to have just a few joint standing commissions, joint standing committees that did stuff in between that were structure and formation and some very specific things. But now there's task forces that are being created. Um, And unfortunately, the time has already passed this time to put your name in, but in two years, there'll be another opportunity. If you're really into climate change, there are task force that need your fire for that. So this is a great time to pray about it and think about where am I being called to be a part of this structure, that there's there's things from top to bottom. I mean, on the Anglican Communion, there's what they call the Anglican Consultative Council, and there's a layperson from the Episcopal Church on there that, um, you know, they're, so they're at every level, there's an opportunity for people to be a part of that process. But find the thing that really brings you fire, because you, when I ran for executive council, there were a number of people that like apologized. Oh, I'm sorry you got elected. And um, and I got to tell you, that is one of the best ministries I've done. I feel so called to that ministry. I feel like I'm really doing good work and using my gifts. Um, so find the spot. Don't be on a committee that makes you not want to show up on a, on a Wednesday night. That's the not, that's not the committee for you. Um, so, so find the thing that really brings you joy and, and, and helps you feel more spiritually connected in those ways and, um, and get out there. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that, particularly with those, those little gifts for the local setting, but there are so many gifts that can be used on the broad structures, even to the level of just, you know, people volunteering to help with general convention who are love organizing and checking in and pieces like that. People are passionate about health and wellness contributing their knowledge and their voice to those um, those processes of task forces and more. Yeah. And general convention will be in Louisville, Kentucky um, in 2024. So it's going to come up real quick. It will come up really fast. And just as before we wrap up, it's I think it's interesting to watch part of our denominations sorting out some of the new lessons from 
this COVID era because the last convention was a year delayed due to COVID and then still had to make major adaptations for folks' safety. But how we take that knowledge in to our systems and prayerfully work through it and with experts and so on to evolve into the little pieces that will change over the next, let's say, three or four triennia. Yeah. I'm really hoping that we learn from those things. Um, Some things felt rushed this time, obviously. There were a lot of things that went through on the consent calendar and people were like, wait, what did we just vote on? Um, But I really think that there were good examples of how especially lay people who work um, outside of the church can be a part of that process without having to take two weeks vacation. I think um, that that gives us the opportunity to have a younger and more diverse um, body, which is definitely necessary for us to move forward. I wholeheartedly agree. Well, I'm going to begin to wrap up. I'm going to review the four points, except I didn't write them down. You wrote them down. Will you review quickly for me what your four points are? Yeah, they really were just the four levels of the church to be to be clear that that we are a part of this thing. So it was the church level, the diocesan level, the denominational level, and then the church wide level of the Anglican Communion that that were part of all of that. So I'm going to pray us out together um, with the prayer for the Thanksgiving for the church, for the mission of the church. And for listeners, if you want to find it, it's on page 838 of the Book of Common Prayer. So let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to reconcile the world to yourself. We praise and bless you for those whom you have sent in the power of the Spirit to preach the gospel to all nations. We thank you that in all parts of the earth, a community of love has been gathered together by their prayers and their labors, and that in every place your servants call upon your name, for the kingdom and power and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen.